Welcome everyone to the 2023 Biophotonics Conference. Thank you all so much for joining us. And in this session, you will hear from Stephanie Kitterlin, Chief Scientific Officer at Perspective Instruments. Stephanie earned her doctorate in biophysics with a research focus on biological cell imaging. Today, she's joining us to discuss multimodal, multi-photon imaging. If you have any questions or comments, you can type them right into the conference chat box that is on your screen. And if you miss part of today's session, you can always come back later and watch it on demand. Stephanie, we appreciate you taking the time to present at the 2023 Biophotonics Conference. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting us. My name is Stephanie Kiederlen from Prospective Instruments, a manufacturer for multi-photo microscopes and femtosecond lasers. Today, I will talk about multimodal multi-photon imaging in the field of life sciences. And the vision of multimodal imaging is that you have a lot of different microscopy techniques to gain a lot of orthogonal data from one sample, ideally in a non-destructive way and also ideally combined in one device. So the concept of our microscope is that we combine some of the modalities, not all of them, but some of the modalities in one turnkey, easy to use, um, compact multimodal microscope. We have the microscope, but we also have the lasers that you need for these imaging techniques at standalone devices. And first, I would like to give a short overview about our microscopes and our lasers. Then we will focus um, on different imaging modalities. And at the end of this talk, I will give an overview of different examples um, where you use, uh, where to use multimodal multiphoton microscopy. So our multi-photon microscopes, um, they are turnkey and easy to use. The, the concept here was to create a microscope that addresses also non-experts. So you don't need a technician to run this microscope because you have one type where the laser is already built in. It's permanently aligned. Then you have another type of microscope where you can couple in an external laser. So this microscope is three photon ready. All the optics are optimized for three photon microscopy. But both of them have the same concept. You have only two parts. You have the controller unit, which you can see under the desk. The controller unit contains the PC, some electronics, and also the light source for the imaging of all microscopy techniques you choose. And then you have the scan head on top. The scan head is mounted on an XYC stage and you can run this microscope in an upright or inverted configuration or even in oblique angles. So the microscope starts in a basic version and then you can add different accessories or modalities depending on your imaging needs. We have also the femtosecond lasers. So all our femtosecond lasers also are turnkey and compact. And air cooled, you can have a dual output laser. You can have a fixed wavelength or tunable wavelengths. They have a low RIN and phase noise. And these lasers are used for a broad spectrum of different applications. In the field of life sciences, they are used for two photon microscopy, higher harmonics microscopy, flim microscopy, or cast microscopy, just to give a few examples. Okay. I would like to start with um, the most frequently used uh, modalities in the microscope, which is the combination of wide field and two photon microscopy. What is the difference between two photon or three photon and wide field microscopy? So first, two and three photon excitation is intrinsic confocal due to a confined excitation volume in 3D space. Um, two and three photon excitation is sample saving because you only excite the fluorophores in the focal plane and also it's a point scanning technique, which means you don't illuminate your whole sample, you go pixel by pixel. And instead of using visible light, you use near infrared light for a higher penetration depth. First, two and three photon excitation is intrinsic confocal. What does it mean? Um, especially for imaging biological samples, which are highly um, um, heterogeneous, you need a very high photon density uh, for a very short time to have um, enough photons to generate a signal that you can detect, detect, but also you want to avoid to harm your sample and to heating up your sample. And to create an excitation volume that is, um, that is strong enough, 
you have to concentrate it in space and time. And how do you do this? In space, you use high NA objectives, and in time, you use femtosecond lasers. So what you can see here is a schematic Jablonski diagram um, showing the different um, imaging techniques. You have the linear wide field technique and the nonlinear two and three photon excitation. For the wide field or one photon, you have one photon exciting a fluorophore and then you detect the emission light. For two and three photon, you have two or three photons that have to hit simultaneously the fluorophore to create a fluorescence process. And um, so two and three photon microscopy are nonlinear microscopy techniques. And you can see a schematic um, drawing of the side view of the focal volume from wide field and multiphoton microscopy. And multiphoton microscopy, because of the absence of multiphoton absorption in the focal plane, you have a very small, small focal volume, which makes this technique intrinsic confocal. But what does it mean on the sample side? Um, here you can see a volume scan, which is a one by one comparison between wide field and multiphoton. This is a volume scan of a sunflower pollen. And a sunflower pollen is a very small specimen. But even though you can see it in the upper row, um, the wide field imaging, that you detect a lot of blurry light or out of focus light, which you detect when you image the sunflower pollen in the wide field modality. What you can do here is to um, do nice wide field imaging. You have to physically sectioning your sample. And then you can do very nice imaging, what you can see on the right-hand side, which is a um, mosaic scan of a tissue section of a sagittal um, mouse head. For the multiphoton, because you have this um, small focal volume, you don't have to section physically sectioning your slide, you can optical sectioning your slide. And by this, you only detect the fluorescence or the, the, the signal from the focal plane. Okay. Uh, two and three photon excitation sample saving, as I mentioned before, um, you only detect the or you only excite the um, the fluorophores in the focal plane, and also it's a point scanning technique, which means you don't illuminate your whole sample all the time. You go point by point, and you use near infrared light, which allows you to penetrate deeper into the tissue, because again you have this um, Jablonski diagram. For the wide field or one photon fluorescence, you use light in the visible range. For two and three photon, uh, you use um, 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 near infrared light. Especially for three photon, you have two distinct um, wavelengths that they're using, 1300 and 1700, because in between you have a very high water absorption. Okay. So this is nice, but of course now one of the questions that is rising up is how deep can you go? And um, again, to generate enough contrast from um, deep tissue imaging, you need to generate um, sufficient signal. And this means, translated, you need enough uh, high photon density in the focal volume. So sufficient light needs to penetrate to the focal volume without aberrations, scattering, or absorption. And you need to hit this optical window. For the two-photon microscopy, it is between 650 and 1300, roughly. But to understand how laser light can penetrate into the tissue, we have to understand how the laser light or the light interacts with the tissue. So you have a lot of different um, interactions. On the left-hand side, you see the ideal situation, which is a perfect focal volume. And on the right side, you see the reality. So when laser light hits the tissue or the specimen, different interaction can occur. Some reflection can occur, but the major impact losing this um, ballistic light penetrating to the focal volume is scattering and absorption. And only a small portion of the light is, trans, uh, is penetrated to the focal plane. And also some aberrations can occur which destroy this very small focal volume. 
as I mentioned before, uh, the biggest impacts are scattering and absorption. So scattering um, occurs because biological tissue um, has a lot of different molecules inside, which generates scattering of the light. And in this case, um, especially the me-scattering occurs where the particle size is bigger than the wavelengths or the, 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 the wavelengths of the incident light. And a rule of thumb roughly is you double the wavelengths, you double the penetration depth roughly. And for absorption, again, um, you try to hit the optical window in the field of two photon microscopy. It's between 650 and 1300 nanometers. And you have to, um, to, to um, keep in mind that there are some molecules like melanin or hemoglobin in the biological tissue that can absorb the light. Okay. Um, but what can you do against it or to uh, help the light penetrate in a ballistic way to the focal volume? You can do optimizations on the hardware side, for example, increase the incident wavelengths of your um, of the of the laser light. Again, a rule of thumb, a rule of thumb is double the wavelengths, you double the penetration depth. You can see here the spectrum of the laser. In the visible range, you don't have a very deep penetration depth, um, whereas when you use, for example, three photon microscopy with 1300 and 1700, you can go much more deeper because you have less, less scattering. Um, you can also use um, accessories like adaptive optics. What you can see here is a transmittive wavefront, modula wavefront modulator from Faceform to correct the wavefront that, um, or to correct for the aberrations. You can see an example, it is a retina of a zebrafish without adaptive optics and when you correct for the wavefront. So you can image much more deeper with more details if you change um, or if you optimize on the hardware side. But of course you can also optimize on the sample side. So one thing that you could do is to choose the right sample. Um, what you can see here is a zebrafish larvae that are transparent by nature until a certain day. So this allows you to do, for example, deep tissue in vivo imaging. In this case, the zebrafish larvae um, were expressing fluorophores, GFP, RFP, and M. sherry. And we collected also the SHG signal, um, label-free SHG signal. I will um, I will give a brief inter introduction of, to SHG a little bit later. But what I want to emphasize here is that if you have the opportunity to choose um, the right sample, then you can penetrate very deep into the sample without any optimization on the sample side. But of course, this is almost never the case. So most of the samples are non-transparent by nature. Here's an example of a glioblastoma cell line which is grown on a chem membrane. And these cells are grow, grow very, very dense and they grow very large tumor models. And um, here you can see in the volume scan that we are limited in the penetration depth roughly to 180 microns. When you can fix and um, when you can fix your sample so you don't need to do in vivo imaging, then you can apply tissue clearing. Tissue clearing is a technique to match the reflect, ref, reflective index of your specimen and to remove pigments to um, get or to, to reduce scattering and to reduce absorption. If you have a good cleared sample, then usually you are not limited by the penetration depth um, from, from, from your microscope side. So in this case, we were able to image the whole tumor, which was 1.3 uh, 1, 1 millimeters in diameter, roughly. Okay, now we talked about uh, imaging depth, but then, of course, the next question that will come up is how fast can you go? So how fast can you do the imaging? 
And in the context of uh, point scanning, so the imaging speed is mostly defined by the scanning speed of the scanners that you are using. And there are different scanner types that you can use. You can use linear galvo-galvo scanning, resonance scanning, or polygon scanning. All of them have different advantages and disadvantages. And uh, what I want to emphasize here, that it is always a trade-off um, from the hardware side. So, for example, which laser do you use or which scan to, to, to decide which scanner, scanner type you want to use? But also on the sample side, um, which field of view do you expect or which signal of noise ratio do you have from your sample? So, there's a difference between the theoretical possible imaging speed and, of course, what really makes sense if you image a real specimen. I have an, uh, uh, an example to um, show the differences between linear galvo-galvo and resonance scanner. Um, for this, I chose a sample, which is a tail of a zebrafish larvae. And first, I did a volume scan to check on the depth of this tail. And then I decided on the intermediate plane, which was roughly at 60 microns. And first, um, what you can see here is a comparison between the imaging speed using linear galvo-galvo scanning. On the left-hand side, you can see a high-resolution image, of course, with the um, um, lower scanning speed. In this case, it was 0 0.07 hertz. And then if you reduce the resolution by reducing the amount of pixels, you can go faster. But you will see um on the especially on the on the 128 times 128 pixel and a frame rate of roughly 17 hertz um artifacts occur on the edges of the images so of course this is no high quality imaging but again if you don't expect a large field of view and you're only interested in the middle region, then you can do very fast imaging with linear scanning as well, like you can see on the very right hand side, which is the heartbeat of a zebrafish, which will be imaged with linear scanning in vivo. But of course, um, very fast dynamic processes, um, resonance scanning is highly beneficial compared to linear scanning. Here you can see the same sample and the same concept. On the left hand side, you have a high resolution image. On the right, on your right hand side, is a low resolution image. But this time, it was imaged with resonance scanning, and you can see that the the the, the imaging speed, of course, is much more higher, and you don't see these artifacts when you go very fast. But at some point does not really make sense to reduce the amount of pixels because you don't see any details anymore, right? So what you can do if you want to image very fast processes, like you can see at the bottom, um, these are retrocytes running through brain capillaries in a mouse brain. You can either um, choose on a, on a, on a, on a trade-off between pixel size and speed, but if you have to increase the imaging speed, then you can only you can re reduce one um, um, the amount of pixels in one direction, so you don't have a full field of view, but you can go up to 100 hertz and still have a um, resolution that is high enough to really see details here. Okay. So now I would like to jump into a few examples. And I would like to start with um, in vitro and in vivo imaging and deep tissue imaging, especially in the field of neuroscience, because we just saw this um, capillary video in the mouse brain. And for this, we have our MPX Neuro Explorer. The MPX Neuro Explorer is the, the microscope in a bundle with different mouse cages. So you have different options for awake um, awake experiments where you have a uh, air floated cage and the mouse is fixed on the head but it still can kind of freely move or got the feeling that it is freely moving or you have a um, heating pad for sleeping experiments with us constantly heating the mouse and also tracking the vital parameters like the heartbeat 
or the breathing rate. And here you can see live setups of the MPX microscopes in mouse experiments. On the left, you can see the scan head in an oblique angle. In the middle, you see a, an experiment with a sleeping mouse. And on the right, you can see the, the, the moving mouse in this air floated um, cage. And here's an example about um, mouse cranial brain imaging. On the left side, you see an in vivo imaging experiment. You can do different experiments with different scanners. For example, if your microscope is equipped with both linear and resonance scanning, you can detect very fast processes, like again, the blood flow in the brain capillaries. You can do volume scans, or you can see um, standard um, 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 reporters like GCAM, which is the calcium um, influx in the neurons. With live in vivo imaging, and especially in the brain, um, you can go roughly to 500 microns in depth. It really depends on the preparation of the glass in the, in the skull of the mouse. You can also resect the brain. And again, you can apply a tissue clearing technique. And then you're, you're mostly not limited on imaging depth. What you can see on your right-hand side um, is a cleared mouse brain where we were limited by the working distance of the objective, which was four millimeters, not by the uh, image, not by the penetration depth. Another field of uh, multimodal imaging in the field of life sciences is 2D, 3D, and 4D imaging. Um, especially since this year the FDA eliminated the general requirement to do um, drug testing in living animals, so especially 3D and 4D imaging, um, or especially uh, general cell culture in the field of um, pathology, cancer, but also pharmacology is getting more and more important. And, but also tissue engineering and bioprinting, which focus on mimicking native tissue, ex vivo. If you have this very large constructs or 3D cell culture, um, you need techniques to image your constructs, right? Here you can see a spheroid, which was um, just freely floating in a, in a Petri dish and stained for life stain. And I, what I would like to empathize here is that the nice thing about using multi-photo microscopy is that you're not limited on the surface. If you want to do, for example, time-lapse imaging, you can choose on any plane. So you always can um, detect all the data during this experiment and you know what's happening inside the spheroid. You can also do 3D volume scans. And um, if you are, want to define the grow area or you want to define the shape of a spheroid, then for example, 3D printed spheroids um, are interesting. But of course, also here, these constructs are getting bigger and bigger and more complex. So you need techniques to really analyze your 3D printed con uh, um, constructs. And in this case, this is a cell printing without the use of scaffolds, so just the cells. Um, in the field of tissue engineering, on the other hand, um, you have a combination of scaffolding proteins combined with cells. And tissue engineering focuses on finding substitutes or ex vivo substitutes to replace injured or diseased tissue. And um, especially collagen is a very popular scaffolding protein. And the nice thing about using collagen or fibrous collagen is that you can detect it label-free with SHG microscopy, which is also one part of the multimodal um, concept of our microscope. You can see on the left an artificial lung tissue. In the middle is an artificial artery and on the right artificial bone tissue, all of them um, combined from collagen and cells. And um, especially in the field of pathology and cancer, um, host light imaging, but also label-free non-destructive imaging is important. And I would like to quickly give an overview about 
label free imaging or biomarkers. So what is a biomarker? A biomarker is a measurable indicator of some biological state or condition. And there are different types of biomarkers, like optical biomarkers or optical properties of a tissue that could be the autofluorescence of a tissue or absorption. There are others like mechanical properties, like the stiffness of, of, of a tumor, for example, or morphological properties, structural properties, like the, the, the shape of the cell nuclei or the wall thickness in case of inflammation. In the field of medicine, biomarkers are mostly used for predictive diagnostic and prognostic indication. In, in the field of research, it's mostly um, very beneficial to have a non or a contact free and non destructive um, signal from your specimen. And today, of course, we focus on the optical properties. Um, so I would like to give an um, example where we combine three different modalities, the wide field two photon and the SHG modality. If you combine all of them, then we have something that we call wide field guided multi-photon imaging. You use the very fast snapshot technique from the wide field modality to make a fast overview of your specimen. In this case, it's a tissue section of a skin melanoma. And then you can decide on different region of interests. And these region of interest you can image with two photon and SHG microscopy in a little bit more detail. The benefit here is that especially the SHG that which allows you to detect the collagen in the tissue tells you something about the tumor border. And the bottom you can see the um, real H&E staining at the ground truth. And um, you can clearly see on the region of interested um, region of interest that you see differences in both the H and E staining and the multiphoton imaging between the lesion, the healthy tissue, and also the, um, um, the, the, the border between healthy tissue and the lesion. Um, I mentioned SHG imaging in this talk very often, so a very brief overview about SHG and also THG. Both of them are nonlinear imaging techniques. This called um, higher harmonics imaging, where two or more photons simultaneously are scattered um, by, um, um, by a, um, a molecule, molecule in, in the case of SHG or reflective index mismatch by um, THG. And I want to emphasize here that SHG and THG are no fluorescence processes, but you can use them in biological tissue for label-free imaging, SHG especially at molecules like collagen or muscles, so all non-central symmetric molecules, and THG at the refractive index transitions like in lipids. Here's an overview of um, SHG and also THG imaging. On the left, you can see a 2D tissue section and from a mouse muscle, which was imaged by SHG only, so complete label-free imaging. And you can see the collagen from the tendon, which is running through the upper left corner of the image. But you also can see the C-bands of the muscle, which you can really um, um, distinguish one by one. And on the bottom, you can see an emerged image from THG imaging and SHG imaging, where you can see the um, lipids from the cells um, in the skin, in the um, in the in the skin rich, uh, in the in the cell rich region of the skin, so in the epidermis, and then the collagen um, in the in the um, the um, in the uh, yeah in the lower regions of the skin. Um, and the nice thing here is that it's not really depends on sample preparation, so you can image SHG and THG label-free in 2D tissue sections, but also native 3D um, uh, um, um, samples and in um, like artificial constructs like collagen scaffolds. And um, so one last thing I would like to show is also label-free imaging using cast microscopy. Um, cast microscopy um, is also a nonlinear um, um, process that occurs when a sample is illuminated by two laser beams called the Stokes beam and the pump beam. And um, the frequency difference between these two beams is equal to the frequency of a molecule vibration. In the case of biological tissue, this is mostly lipids. On the bottom row, you can see an example of adipose tissue and also see elegance image with cast microscopy, both indicated by red. 
And this is also a complete labor-free technique. I would like to summarize this talk about multimodal multiphoton imaging. So multimodal imaging or multimodal microscopy, it's intrinsic confocal. Um, it allows you to do optical sectioning, so 3D volume scans. You use a near infrared laser, um, which allows you to penetrate deeper into the tissue. And because you use near infrared laser, you also have less photo damage. Um, you can multiplex in our microscope up to four channels simultaneously. And this multimodality allows you to generate orthogonal data from one sample. And um, so you have one microscope and you can have, have a broad range of different kinds of samples. I would like to empathize our references if you're interested to learn more about multiphoton microscopy. So please um, check out our latest articles. And I would like to thank you all the collaborators. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you. And I'm finished with my talk today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining us to discuss multimodal microscopy for life science exploration. Before we wrap up here, I just want to remind everyone in the audience, if you haven't already, you can type your questions and comments into the conference chat. And do not worry, if you have not been answered yet, you'll be reached via email at a later date. This session is hosted by us at Photonics Media, and we certainly hope you're enjoying the third annual Biophotonics Conference. Thank you all so much for joining us.